the next session, oh, actually, I'm going to ask a question here. How many of you guys have violated a copy law, copyright law this week? Maybe. Have you used a Google image? Have you downloaded some stuff? Maybe. How many of you don't know if you've, if you've uh, violated a copy law, copyright law? I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if I'm, I'm breaking the law or not. But in the next session, we're going to have a bit of a debate and maybe a, a deeper conversation about some of these issues. Um, online digital copyrights yield great power. And again, with great power comes great responsibility. But the larger question is, are, are copyright laws helping or hindering creativity? And where to is homage stop and plagiarism begin? And what does it say about Australians when we are the largest downloader of pirated content in the world? So all this and more will be discussed by our next two presenters, John Lawrence, from the, uh, who is the Executive of Officer um, for the Electronic Frontiers Australia, a, no a non-profit organization that champions uh, digital freedom, um, access, and privacy, and Trish Hepsworth, the Executive Offer Officer of the Australian Digital Alliance, an organization that's committed to writing Australia's copyright imbalance. Please welcome me and joining John and Trish. Just to give you a bit of an introduction, um, as Kelsey said, I work for a copyright advocacy group, basically. So we look after copyright for schools and universities and libraries and galleries and museums and tech companies and consumers and all of the sort of people who use and interact with copyright. And one of the things that we've been worried about for a long time is the way that we've got a Copyright Act that was written in 1968 that potentially doesn't really get the internet. And that would be the polite way of saying it. So last year, we actually sponsored a project run by Dan Illick, who might be familiar to some of you. He's an Australian comic who did a lot of work. Hungry Beast, etc. Hungry Beast, that sort of stuff. So we sponsored him to throw this together for us. I think that uh, we might just start having a bit of a chat and see if we can resurrect anything up the back. Mind you, you're all mobile, you're all mobile able. We should just tell you to all go to the website and check it out. All right, perhaps I should um, do a little introduction of myself. Um, so Electronic Frontiers Australia, as you would have seen, we've been around, uh, we just quietly turned 21 a couple of weeks ago, which is kind of cool. And the, the way I like to present what we do is essentially um, we are trying to stop the government from ruining the internet. And the reality is that um, there are an, a number of different policy areas where governments are, by their very nature, quite antithetical to what the internet is about. Um, this government particularly is not very internet friendly, let's say, and we can, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit more detail, but um, copyright is one of the areas that I work in where I think we actually have the potential to do some, to make some real positive change soon, and I think, um, I think we're going to see some, some interesting movements shortly. Um, we may have a new Prime Minister soon, who I think is going to be a little bit more switched on than perhaps our current one might be in this context, uh, and that's probably not going to hurt. You are alive during the fastest period of cultural evolution in human history. The internet allows billions of people to create, modify, mash up, and share trillions of pieces of information instantaneously, simultaneously, collaboratively. In order for culture to evolve, it requires small, indivisible units of cultural transmission. Like cells and cells, these are then reproduced, refined, and remade into something new. Everything is remade in this cultural evolution. What if I told you that in Australia, this new way of sharing, communicating, memifying, remixing is illegal. Well, under Australian copyright law, it is, and no one knows it, so no one cares. Many countries, including the US, have a fair use provision in their copyright law, which allows a range of uses as long as they don't take revenue away from copyright owners or harm them in other ways. The big thing about fair use is you don't need a new, specific exception every time some new technology or activity comes along. All kinds of creative acts are permissible as long as you're being fair. In Australia, our copyright 
copyright law is the opposite. Unless the law specifically says you can do something, you can't. Full stop. But many of us do anyway. Copyright law is designed to encourage creativity, not stifle it. In Australia, we've got it wrong. We do have fair dealing provisions in our law. Fair dealing allows the use of other work when you're reporting the news, doing research or study, satirizing or parodying, formally critiquing the content or giving legal advice. Otherwise, you cannot reproduce or modify anything. If you share these Photoshop pictures on your Facebook wall, only one of them is legal in Australia. If you guess the one on the left, then you're correct. The one on the left is satirical and a parody. The one on the right is just funny, but illegal. The Here are some other things that are illegal under Australian copyright law. Making your own Mario Brothers costume, that's a breach. Playing music off your iPod at a funeral, that's a breach. Singing k san in public, that's a breach. Creating a search engine in Australia would be impossible, that's a breach. While transferring a DVD you own to watch on your tablet is an offence, transferring a VHS tape is okay. Why? Because the law specifically says so. Yep, the law actually says videotape. Video tape. In Australia, we have Betamax laws for Google World. This is not about piracy. This is about our culture. Piracy is about stealing. Culture is about creation. Prior to last century, culture was participatory. Everyone created, everyone consumed. People in turn spun their own stories, sang their own songs from others they had seen and heard. But recorded media changed all that. The last century saw culture become a product, something that was packaged, sold, consumed, and thrown away. But over the last 15 years, thanks to the internet and a massive drop in the cost of technology, participating in culture at a high level is possible. These silos for creativity are no longer the coffee shops and campfires, but are the web platforms and internet forums that breed extraordinary works every minute of the day. These digital places breed ferocious creativity and encourage the collision of ideas to create many works of culture that aren't made for commercial purposes, but made by amateurs for the love Thanks to the internet, culture is once again about participation and not about being passive. It's nothing new for digital natives, it's just the way we tell stories. Everyone is a creator now. So as creators of digital culture, what can we do? Well, right now, Australian copyright laws are under review, and it's important to show our leaders just how creative we can be. Join the creationists now. Sign a petition to bring fair use to Australia, and post an example of transformative work that you've created for non-commercial use. It could be any Thing. Videos, pictures, songs, mashups, lol caps, tweets, 3D printing, jokes, montages, collages, anything. They show our leaders that creativity is not a crime. Creationistas.com. For more examples of copyright hypocrisy, click on the videos below or go to creationistas.com. The reality is that I suspect most of the people in this room have a fundamentally inaccurate understanding of what Australian copyright law is. Um, we inevitably, and this has got everything to do with Facebook and Google, um, but I think we inevitably find ourselves believing that Australia has the same copyright law as the US, and the reality is that we don't, and this is the problem. Do you want to talk to that? As a general rule of thumb, who reckons they've got a really firm understanding of copyright? Yeah, okay, and how many other people think yeah, that Leanne potentially does, they've right. broken copyright in the last week? I can guarantee that everyone in this room has yeah. breached so the Copyright Act. I think what we're looking at is there is a small minority of people in this country who actually fundamentally know what copyright is, and the rest of us sort of work on a bit of a nagging feeling that probably, potentially, some of that stuff was not quite kosher, but, yeah, who cares? So... Indulge the lawyer for one second. Do apologize, lawyer in the room. Copyright basically is a property right over the expression of ideas, which if you take it into non-lawyer speak, means that if you make something, you then have the right to exploit that, and anybody else who does something with it is probably breaching your copyright. So there are a couple of things where you need to know. It's not ideas, can't copyright ideas, but it's the expression of ideas. Because it protects expression, it's got to actually be in material form. So you've got to have written it down or thrown it into a photo on a website or made a movie out of it. It's got to be in material form. And it's got to be made by a person, which, did anyone see the story last year about the macaque taking its own photo? So there was a photographer who was out 
in Borneo or somewhere, and he got his camera stolen by a group of monkeys. And the monkeys larked around and took photos of themselves, because it turns out taking a selfie goes across species. And Wikipedia thought this was awesome and an excellent photo of a macaque, so they put it up on Wikipedia's page. And the photographer said, hey, that's my photo, take it down. And they said, it's not your photo, it's a monkey's photo. And the photographer said, no, that's my camera. And Wikipedia said, it might be your camera, mate. That's not your photo. The photo was taken by a monkey. A monkey is not a person. Therefore, there is no copyright in that photo. And there is no copyright in that photo. So that's what you've got for a base of copyright. Copyright exists automatically. You don't have to register it. You don't have to put that silly little C sign on anything. You automatically own copyright the minute you create something. If you've got lots of people who work on it, they've all got copyright. And that means that anybody else who copies it, who adapts it, who uses a bit of it, who links it up, puts a stupid quote on it and throws it on their Twitter account, who shares it without permission, who absentmindedly responds to an email in which it's embedded four emails down as they copy every single previous message, all of that is a breach of copyright. So I think that's a pretty good explanation of the fact that there is a genuine disconnect, I think, particularly in this country between our rather archaic copyright law and, and practice. And the reality is that, as you've just explained, all of us routinely share copyright material without permission. Um, we do that in a way that I think in many cases does absolutely no harm to the copyright owner and in many contexts I would suggest probably benefits the copyright owner. So talk to us about sort of how we might move from where we are to fair use. So who's ever heard of fair use? Okay. Hands up all those people who think that some of the stuff they do on the internet is fair use. Hands up the number of people who think we have fair use in Australia. There's still a disturbing amount of people who say yes to that. We don't, absolutely don't. Um, so what fair use is, is, it, is it, it's an exception to copyright. So you know, copyright exists automatically, stops you doing everything else. But there are some certain circumstances in which you can use other people's stuff without it being an infringement. Now in the US, that concept is called fair use, and it basically looks at what you're doing with something, what it is you're using, how much of you're using it, and whether it's actually going to cause harm to the copyright holder. And if it's not going to cause harm, and you're doing it for a good purpose, it'll be fair use. So for example, the Hathi Trust managed to scan whole lots of out-of-commerce works to make them um, searchable for their students and for people online. That was held to be fair use. A lot of the stupid memes that people will throw up, because they basically cause no harm, they're probably going to be fair use. A lot of documentary filmmakers rely all the time on fair use to be able to quote things from media, to be able to put up photos, because they're doing something for this public purpose to create something new. It'll be fair use. In Australia, we don't do it quite like that. We've got these things called fair dealing, and it basically works a bit the same, but they have to be for a set purpose. So in Australia, you can copy some stuff if it's for your own personal research and study. You can copy something if it's for the purposes of reporting the news. You can copy something if it's for criticism or review. And thanks to the panel flamingly losing a giant court case, you can now do it for parody and satire. But for anything else, no. So we don't have one, for example, for quotation. So who's heard the Men at Work song, Land Down Under? How many people remember the bit where they got sued because they used a bit of kookaburra sits in the old gum tree? Once again, spectacularly lost. Because we don't have the sort of laws that would give us the ability to do an artistic quotation from one work to another work. And when we're talking about digital creation, that's actually a really big problem. John, can we have the next slide for a sec? Yes. So this is one of my favorite slides. Basically what this slide says is Van Gogh was a dirty pirate. 
as uh, Banksy would cheerfully quote, he would say, good artists borrow, great artists steal. The way that art works is that we perpetually borrow and reimagine from what we already have. Nobody walks out into a perfectly formless blank world and suddenly goes, I'm going to create something. Artists work by drawing on the things they see, from nature through to Van Gogh, through to you know, beautiful geometrical patterns that you end up with in buildings. And that's sort of the process of art. But because copyright stops you taking snippets and because copyright stops you from adapting works and translating works, you find that you're suddenly shrinking your source material and your ability to create freely. So um, that's a good point, I think, to, to sort of pause and think about what the internet actually is. And the internet is copying. Yeah, so that is what the internet is. So there's a real problem here where I think um, we have laws and policy approaches that are, by definition, opposed to what the internet is. So a lot of the internet works on a concept that they like to call permission, permissionless sharing, which basically means that people are able to transfer files across. Now, to take sort of a very easy example, how many of you occasionally stream things from YouTube or something like that? Right. Now, you are making a stack of copies while you are doing that. So there's the original file, and then every time it goes through and it goes through a server, it ends up on your computer when you are buffering something, your computer is making copies of all of that. Because we potentially don't want to spend all day long and have even higher internet bills, you know, we do things like caching. So what caching does is instead of having to go right back to the source to retrieve something every single time somebody requests it, you make a copy so that you don't have to actually dial off to the US. You can dial domestically. It makes our internet cheaper and quicker. It's a good thing. But it's also kind of not really copyright law compliant because there are all these copies being made. Sorry? I'm trying to like, get John to feed me questions because I totally want to talk about something. <laughs> Which is? I want to talk about um, how long copyright lasts and uh, yes. okay. the public domain. So Trish, explain to us. Um... <laughs> yeah, very good. So the purpose of copyright is to obviously give a creator the ability to uh, exploit their work. Uh, and to get a um, monetary return from that. Explain to us how the current um, copyright term, which in Australia, since our lovely little free trade agreement with the US, is now life plus 70 years. Explain to us how that promotes new creativity. So it doesn't. And that, that's it in a nutshell. And this is where you get onto the problem of the fact that Australia has a sepia or occasionally black and white coloured history. So copyright term is currently life plus 70 years. So it goes until somebody dies and then another 70 years for almost everything. And this has got nothing to do with Mickey Mouse, does it? This is entirely to do with Mickey Mouse, mainly so what happened was that Disney, of course, who has very valuable copyright, suddenly looked at Mickey Mouse going out of copyright and went, ah, oh, that's not so great, and we ended up with a giant copyright term extension in the US, which then got passed on to us through a free trade agreement, because, you know, sugar access, copyright, whatever. The trouble is that copyright, unlike a lot of other intellectual property like patents or trademarks or something like that, doesn't have a use it or lose it provision. So it's one thing for Disney, who's obviously commercially exploiting Mickey Mouse, to have this extended term because Mickey Mouse is still being promoted and published and distributed. I tell you what's not being promoted and distributed. It's like boring reports from the 1960s in Australia. It's archival photos that are sitting in the bottom of archives, mildly going mouldy. But they're all still protected by copyright. Now, we get an even bigger problem in that unpublished works never go out of copyright. Just because of this really weird quirk, unless something is published, it's in perpetual copyright. 
So you end up with these absolute giant stores of cultural material. I mean, the National Library's got something like two million unpublished works in their collection, and they reckon about a million of those are orphans, so works they just don't know who the copyright owner would be, which means that to try and get those out and make them accessible, you're suddenly risking breaching copyright. So if you go and you look through, and look, the galleries and the museums in this country are doing a fantastic job. If you have never gone to something like Trove, Google it, T-R-O-V-E, go and have a look, and the material they've got up is fantastic. But you'll notice almost all the photos are black and white. Because photos up until 1954 are out of copyright, and then we changed the copyright term under the Free Trade Act, and now it's life plus 70. We're not going to see another photo go into the public domain for another 10 years. So, so it's way easier to find information about Melbourne 1930 than it is to find information from 1970. And there, I think there was a really good example of that recently with the, um, what are we up to, 100, the, the centenary of Gallipoli. Um, and there was a real problem for the libraries and the museums in terms of publishing um, diaries and so forth from people that were there because for that reason they had they, no idea who owned the copyright um, and because our copyright law is so um, reflexively res restrictive, they were basically, well, we can't publish it. So the Gallipoli one is a huge deal. So the War Memorial and the State Libraries and everybody else have huge Gallipoli ones. And they go to a lot of lengths to try and track down copyright owners. So if you go to the War Memorial, there's actually a page up where they've put sort of snippets and they've basically said, if you've got a copyright owner, come, find us. Because we, we amongst other things, we'd love to be able to collect, connect these collections to actual people. To do that, they breach copyright. And there's a bit of an exception. We push a special library exception as far as we possibly can to try and get this done. But if you don't do that, the chances you will ever find the owner are nil. But even if you find the person whose collection that is, you might then be able to clear copyright for the diary, but you can't clear copyright for all the letters that people sent to them because all of those letters have different copyright holders and there's no way you can trace them back. So um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, what I suspect would be good at this point is to try and sort of circle back and say, okay, well, how is this really actually, what is the impact of, of these outdated and inflexible laws on digital creativity in this country? One of the things I, so there's, we've talked a lot about what it is you can do as creators, the way that most people who actually are creating stuff have problems. But the, the other really big problem we hit is, I think, on distribution platforms. So you can do all you want to make stuff, and to be fair, if you flagrantly rip off people's photos and um, make all sorts of things and keep them in a box under your bed, nobody is ever going to know. But most people who are creating and the people that we want to be creating, you need to be able to distribute it. Because otherwise, what's the point? And this is where we get to the point where you, we have this key platform issue. So once upon a time, if you wrote a book you went, and you wanted people to read it, you needed to go and find a publisher and they published and they distributed it to bookshops and people got it. Then we got the internet and one of the biggest boons the internet ever did for this creative space was to make those barriers to entry to get your stuff distributed so much lower. Who has ever posted something to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, YouTube, any of those things? Every single person, yeah? Okay, let's do it. Who has never put anything up onto one of those internet platforms? Yeah, good. So everybody uses them. You'll also notice they are all US-based platforms. And one of the huge reasons for that is because the US has a, a system called Safe Harbor System. And basically what that means is if online platforms follow certain steps, Mainly, you get told that there's infringing material, you take the infringing material down, they're immune from prosecution. We don't have that here. Now, on many cases, it's good that we can use the US platforms. That gives us huge reach. But I do worry about the fact that we basically inhibit any domestic-grown platforms by taking them away from this, 
this sort of protection because it's a huge global industry, obviously, and Australia is a very small country. And I do think that ability to create and support domestic platforms is probably really important, even in a globalised digital space. So um, a, a really sort of simple example of that is that it would be almost literally impossible for Google to operate in this country under our copyright law. Google's cheerfully on record as saying under Australian copyright law they can't run, they can't actually host their search engine here, yeah. just as a base. And they, they sort of, they're on record as saying, look, we couldn't have developed Google here. There's a very good reason it was developed in the US and not here. So uh, I think that, I think we're being called to time. So I think um, the, the point, I guess the takeaway that we'd like you to sort of um, understand is that essentially our current copyright law in this country is fundamentally opposed to the internet. Um, it needs to change. Um, there was a report, um, a recommendation from the Australian Law Reform Commission that was, that. Um, Australia's favourite Attorney General launched at Fisher's excellent conference in February last year. Um, the government has done exactly nothing about moving on those recommendations. Um, they are, of course, moving to increase the legal sanctions for copyright enforcement, um, and I'm sure that's got nothing to do with the fact that Village Roadshow is, um, is I think, the largest donor to the Liberal Party and possibly also the Labor Party in this country. So um, the reality is that the solutions are there, the report's been done, the recommendations are there. We need to apply pressure uh, to our politicians to move on this. I think um, the Labor Party is actually, I think, well inclined to support this, and we need to get um, our government on board as well. But thank you, Trish. Yeah, there's no off buttons on these things. You just have to like basically just drop the mic, which I think you just did. That was a f an incredibly fascinating um, conversation. I could listen to you guys for another two hours, which we might need to do at Beer Deluxe a little bit later. So let's continue yeah. this conversation because I think, yeah, that one, that's a whole other conversation that we could have a whole other talk on. So follow these guys on Twitter and, and let's find each other afterwards because I think that there's a lot more we need to talk about in terms of privacy and, and the ways that we can actually move um, Australia forward. But thank you so much for your time, you guys.